What is the perfect watch collection? Is it finding a watch that you once saw in a magazine back in 1995 while in high school dreaming of owning that watch one day? Is it something that's so rare that no one else in the world has one? Or perhaps it's as simple as something that simply sings to you as a collector. We're back in Miami and we're meeting with a brand new client that we recently have met to go over his collection as well as hopefully sell him a few pieces. Bro, one special one on purpose. It's my first watch I ever bought in my lifetime. It's a Mark Echo for $200. <laughs> you know what's up? I was 15 like years Echo, old. Like Echo Limited? Mark Echo? Echo? Yeah. Oh, shit. Remember the, the clothes, store the back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So that's was the that, first. Was that done by, was that, uh, did, did Fubu buy them too? I think Fubu ended up buying them. That's the first. Echo. That was a shit back in the day. I was like, at, yeah, yeah, they had, the, Echo, they had yeah. the Echo on them. Yeah. yeah. The Rhino. We the did the, that's the first watch ever. I was 15 years old. It was like 200, it was like 200 bucks. I was like, oh man, if I get this, all the girls in, in middle school are gonna be on me. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, 15, that's not bad. <laughs> this is a meta you for, because yeah. you made me not, yeah. you know. Which by the way, <laughs> I, I didn't want to tell you what, when you were buying that, not, not to kill the other guy's deal, because what we do. This was ours. But I told you, I asked you specifically. I can't, but the problem. But you got to be, you know, you got to be my guy. Because I, I don't to, mind, I, I, I don't mind you making money. As long as we're for team, does that make sense? It makes all the but sense. But I, I, so, I didn't ask you. I knew it was your watch. I said, "Yo, this is your watch." And you're like, so "Nah." You, so you sold this because of us. Yes. Yeah. It I was know. your watch. I know. And I told. So, it's a very simple explanation in the industry, right? It's like if I ever call you, right? And, or if you ever call me, say, so, "I mean, you got that uh, RM. I'm interested. I'll be back in town in 11 days." I don't give a. How many people will call me during those 11 days right. and offer me more money, less money? It doesn't matter. Right. It's going to be not available for 11 days gotcha. until you tell me it's not for me or it's a relationship. But he gave me 200 for 5980. That was good. strong. Yeah, strong. 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 Well, back then that was just back then that was the number. What back then? So he, was a couple weeks ago. Yeah, a couple weeks. Like two weeks. Not two yeah. weeks. He gave me 195 for the 5980. Yeah. And I bought this for 315. So overall, it was a good deal. That's I want to know <laughs> how you ended up with this. Oh because my god! Because I mean, if people will reach. People will reach for the skeleton and the richer meal and the Daytona. Yeah, yeah. How did you end up with this? Because I'm very impressed with this. Yeah. Cartier Collection Privé is something I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to Cartier, there are collectors out there. It's one of the most collected brands, but it's very low key. Like mm -hmm. all these Cartier collectors, you'll see some dinky little tiny Cartier, right. and all of a sudden it's a half a million dollars wide, right? Yeah. Just for those that know, no. But for me, when they, the Pasha is one of the most iconic designs. And to do it this way, I mean. This yeah, it's one of my favorite watches. I the front, the back, yeah. like this is a beautiful watch. This is no. not a watch you would expect in this collection. And I loved it and I was gonna even buy it. They have a white um, gold version with green I feel eyes like as well. yellow works though. Like, me too, yeah. You know, I, feel like, I feel like it's richer in yellow. This is a watch that, <laughs> that's, that, I have a story on this one. So, hmm. uh, originally, I actually know the gentleman responsible for going to AP and saying, hey, make these. And they did. Hmm. This is the guy out of Dubai. He did 10 and uh, uh, at the time was rose hmm. and white. And then I think they did a yellow one as well. And when he first came up with this, I'm like, this is going to be a flop. Well, they did the same thing in a turbion version too. They, they yeah. started with this and they did a turbion yeah. version. And I told him, I said, he showed me the thing and I'm like, I think it's going to be a flop. You know, you're jumping That's on funny. a bandwagon, this, that, and the other. Little did I know, a year later, yeah, they cool. quadrupled in value. Because cool. they, they made such a short production run on them. Are they like, uh, seriously, actually, somebody's, don't assume I know anything. Uh, are these um, like, uh, Limited edition? No, they're limited production. Limited they're, production. The original, so they're, they're order, the original okay. order, he ordered 10 and 10. Got it. Because that was the minimum order that they told so that's him. That's the everyone gives you. you, you know, like, <laughs> because listen, at, even after dealer discount and you know the retail is quite high on them, so they wanted a minimum right. order. Yep. You know, when you gotta go to AP, you're not flexing but placing a half a million dollar order. You gotta order a couple million dollars, right? So yep. and that's how 10 and 10 came about and then they did it again. White or rose? Uh, like I, I've, I've said this many times before, I prefer a rainbow something on a lighter metal. What do you guys think? White gold rainbow or rose gold rainbow? Comment below. Your GTI, which is actually one of my favorite watches of all time. Uh, AKA it, the gold metal, well that's not the gold metal. No, that's not the gold metal. The gold metal is all break, but I actually prefer titanium. So it's lighter. It's lighter, yeah. Hmm. Which is essence is, is more or less the, the, the core values of what Richard Mill is. It's a racing machine on the wrist, so why go heavy? Right. They don't do anything in platinum anymore, they used to. So tell me about this. Why did you Why did you decide to go this route? You know, was, well, funny. Uh, everyone, in, I feel like everyone in the, in the watch industry tells you not to buy Richard Mille. Facts, haters, can't afford them. Double balance, 
Rose gold. Rose gold. Like these are these are the gold medals. Mm -hmm. Like like you you brought some gold medals. You have you have the Rolex. You have the AP. You have the the, the Richard Mille. So what was the final result? Why did you end up going? Well, yeah. So I went to. Is it the flex? No, you know it's. What do you like no, about? Flex is past. I think is uh we're past flex on this. But no, what it was is that is my favorite daily watch to wear for me. That's such a Miami watch too on the white strap. The white strap it's, it's 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 perfect. Yellow was a little too tacky. The white looks better. And white too. Look at the size of my wrist. Right. And I put that and on and it wears correctly no matter what. Yeah. This is the king right Beautiful, here. yeah. Day -day. Like that one? Yep. The data yeah. the data to me is the king. Always has been. Two two eight two three nine with a Pave diamond though. I mean, this dial, you know what it is? It's a flex, but it's low key. Like, it makes a point. No, it's beautiful. Not, it's, it's, it's so I'm clean, glad so there's no diamond bezel on this. That's all I'll say. Yeah, very A baguette good. bezel very, would work, but I'm just glad it's just a dial. I'm a big fan of diamond watches. However, there are certain pieces where you just have to stop at a certain point. That watch also comes with a regular diamond bezel, and it makes it too much. Just that diamond dial alone makes a solid point, and it makes it for a beautiful watch. Now, we, we spoke about this. We talked to somebody. Yeah. This can actually be redone. Uh, yeah, it can. It's a process, it but can. it can be put can. back to its original. So, okay, so, you, so let me ask you this question, I could, because I don't, I don't remember if we spoke about it. Do you have the original components of this, or they, they set the diamonds in the original case for them? I think it's original. I think the case it's is in the original. original. So it's in the original. Yeah. Okay. It's in the original. Right. They drilled the original. Because case. a lot of times what they do is they'll remanufacture the case and the bracement, keep the movement in it. No, so it's original. This is the original case form. Can it be revamped? We're not sure. There, there, there's a lot of... We have guys that are good enough mechanics to wear because basically what happens is you pull out each diamond one by one. Then you have to you take the watch apart and you have to laser each part, meaning that you add metal on, uh, you re-laser it, and then you get it back to factory finish. So I really, really want to make a deal with this guy. So he's giving us a 5976 bust down. This is a very, very, very niche mark and I don't want to hurt the guy. When you go to buy a piece like this normally, you actually pay a heavy premium because essentially you're paying for the watch, which has a market value today of around 450 to 500, throwing diamonds on there. So whoever did the work or whoever bought the watch is gonna make an additional premium on that watch. However, when you go to sell that watch back, there is a humongous, humongous drop in price. And although I wanna help this guy out, I have to be very, very careful in placing a number on a watch that seemingly is very difficult to sell. Yes, what do we do with this watch? This is the only watch I don't like. Well, we do with this watch, <laughs> what, I, what I would recommend- it's only watch I don't like. What I would recommend for, for financial purposes is like, leave it with us to right. put it with one of our guys, risk-free. In, in other words, if somebody was gonna buy this from you to resell or take it in trade, dollar value is going to be much, much, much less than if they were going to sure. take it and then resell it. Now it's time to show them what we got. What I wanted to do is bring, we had discussed this before he left yesterday, and I said I want to bring look, size, innovation. And th these three all have them. Uh, and I also wanted to bring a little bit of flex, which is this. And I also wanted to bring the ultimate flex, which is this. This is a dangerous meeting. I know. I know. This is what I, uh, The ultimate flex, which is this. Mm. So we talked about, I'm going to start from the baddest uh, watch, which is obviously is this. This is the grand complication of the granddaddy of them all. Ceramic. That made it in a full ceramic case. This is full blown perpetual split second chronograph, minute repeater, automatic, right? This is their, This is what AP is all about. This is the essence of AP. This is a watch that not many companies out there can physically even make. Yeah. Oddly enough, if I move to the lap timer, Mm -hmm. which is this guy, this is the most innovative chronograph made to date, and they just repeated that chronograph in a total 1159. So now this is the first one that they made. This is very similar to like Black Panther style? Uh, it's because it's the concept case. So what, so what you're looking at is this and case. that is yeah. the concept case. The only other chronograph on the market today, and that happened uh, a few months ago, Max Buser from MBNF, he made the sequential chronograph where he's able to mm -hmm. put two chronographs to work in a single watch, which was Mission Impossible, this was done by McDonald. But this to date is the only watch they can measure lap time. Not like a split second chronograph, but a lap time chronograph, hence the lap mm -hmm. timer. That is the first automatic concept that they made. So if you notice the rotors in the front, in the front. if you shake it, you can see. See, see, see the front? Yeah. Oh, I got you. Yeah, yeah. in the front. Yeah, in, order front. Yeah, in, order to, in order to put the complications that did in the concept and the technology, it didn't allow for it to make it automatic. It took them a good, uh, a good 16 years to actually make that an automatic, which is a feat in its own. This is also renowned by P. You can sort of see, this is a dead giveaway right here. 
But what they did here was they came out with the first Royal Oak Offshore Turbiot, and the most impressive thing about it is the fact that this is a 10-day power reserve. And the reason for that is because what's in this watch takes so much energy from the mainspring to make this last for 10 days is virtually impossible. Again, a feat that nobody has achieved. They first did it in their Cabinet 4 offshore, and the cool part about it is that the Cabinet 4, they, they made the power reserve, and they actually took the last 24 hours, and they were showing how the power was still consistent to the watch in the last 24 hours. One of the key points about Royal Oak Concepts, Royal Oak Offshore Turbion Chronographs and Grapple Complications, why they don't garner such a crazy premium over their suggested MSRP, size. size. You're able size. to swing this. The wrist is good here for size. this case. Not everybody has a <laughs> No, seriously. Right. So, so you want to laugh? This is my favorite case size from AP. This is literally the, the concept case is my favorite case. case. And I can't wear it. It's too big. Right. And, as, and when they came out, by the way, when they came out with the Black Panther, I was doing backflips because they made it small. It was crazy. I don't know how the f John Mayer pulls his watch off. And he's, and got, he pulls he's, got it off. A, he's got a small wrist. No. What do you mean small wrist? I have a small wrist. Somehow he pulls this off. He wears this. Well, he has that. Right. I, I, I can't. And there, you'd be hard pressed to find an RM that I would take over this watch, but I just can't. I can't put it on. My personal. And oddly wrist. enough, RM gets up there in size, but yet the ergonomics of that are better. This is full set box papers, full set box papers, full set box papers. I've never seen this in my this, life. This particular one does not full set box papers. Because the guy that originally owned it didn't want to give it up. So he has it, just doesn't give it up? He won't give it up. He's, he's, there's it was a, a lot of these, if gift. you can imagine, I mean, who buys this? Would he give it up in the future? No. <laughs> Same thing we had a problem. Let's just say he's a, he's a prominent figure. <laughs> got it. You know, uh, whose network starts what, with a ZP. Got it. And a lot of these guys, those, I say, I don't give a my name is tied to that card, I'm not giving it up. This one we're gonna pass on just because of that big box for everything. I love that the one. The one that's hanging off the chest. Yeah. Oh, can I see? see that's see, actually like, cool people tend, to gear, people tend to gear, people tend to go right back towards recognizability. I just actually know, well, I, wanted, I wanted to buy this actually over this even, but uh, the only had to stay on steel versions when I, want, I was trying to buy it. So I like white. I like the D weight. Different ball game. Gold. A lot less made baguette bezels. Anything with baguettes is going to be in very tiny production. No, it's full doesn't right. matter from home. It is full length. Oh, it is. That's oh, good. I'll, I'll count the links right now. I didn't even count the links. Okay. Up there They're right full now. links. Yeah. I had Peter put them back. It was good. Uh, apparently, you need extra extra links. The bottom line is, is, I know for a fact, and I know people inside AP, in terms of production numbers, you're talking about one one in a hundred. Right. Right. Even though there's not really that much of a difference between you have a precious metal, precious metal, rose gold, white gold. I get bezel. The bottom line is, is that this is probably produced one to a hundred of that watch. Same thing. As long as it's right, right deal, this is no brainer to me just because I already love this watch. So this is better than that watch in my head. If it makes sense for you, like I want 320,000 for this watch. To me, this is worth 190 in trade. So what 190 minus 320. So that's 320, 190? That, that's $130,000 difference. Letting marinate. Um, I will not be as tough as the negotiators you have. No, this is dope. This is really cool. It kind of matches the, the jewelry to Beautiful. today. I love that too, though. However, it's I love this more. Right. right, right. The idea for me was I really wanted to introduce you into the world of these. Too late now, right? right? These, right? All right. Well, separate, what's, separate, what's, separate deal. That could be a separate, Se separate deal, right? I still like that watch. How much is that watch anyway? This was two fifty-five. Great. Right. Coming up next. Real little concept. It's gonna be on chronograph. Oh wow. You made it sound fancy. Here's a deal that I like because it's, it seems to me that you are interested in potentially selling. Where's that rainbow piece? I'm down with it. That. Right? But those are two I showed you. I like those are my yeah. least, not least, but. Well, they're small for you. Kind of feel it's too. Well, it's not small. I, I like to get. Same, it, listen. It's See, this looks bigger because of the baguette. Yeah. So it looks better to my wrist, in my opinion. I still like this too, though, so. Don't forget uh, it. He's about to make an offer he can't refuse. I know what you think so. Too. I'm gonna very, very simply. I'm gonna split the difference between my offer and your offer, 115, 130 at whatever the difference is, right? 125. Between. <laughs> you said between. <laughs> I like the so, way <laughs> Split. If you want to trade it, you right? Know, <laughs> it's make sure. Trade <laughs> this one and this one. Yeah. For these two, it's gonna come out to uh, 185 difference. So however you figure that out in your head. No, that's terrible. That's a terrible deal. How do you figure that out? These two were so, like, so, you said so. this is worth 225 to 250. You said it's 250. To sell. To, to, well, I mean, in my head. Not maybe sell. to sell. May, like, that, that's a yeah, yeah. May, big, This is an okay big, deal big, here, maybe. but just, I don't big, like this. Big maybe. Big. I'm saying I don't like this deal. It's not, you don't want this. I get it, I get it, listen. This is a bad Between one. here we split it, right? 
I want 130, you want 115, I'll split it. 120 to 5. I'll do 120. Done. What? Okay, so that's 120. 120. So that's 120, right? And I'm at 190 and 255. Nah, right, so nah, I got, I'll, I'll hold on this. I'd rather let you consign this. That's what, okay. That totally. If fine. you don't mind, that's I'd rather just fine. you just take it that's and this. I would much rather consign this. it because totally of that line. Fine. Totally fine because of that line because because of the level of difficulty of what that is, right? He wants to consign it. We're fully down to consign and get a maximum value for his piece. It's fine. You could say three hundred thousand to me, and I can tell you, hey, I don't want three hundred thousand. You could also say two hundred thousand, and I'll say it's very fucking. I'm difficult. big on like you, me buying. Wholesale, you make some money and then you sell it at wholesale. I'm cool with that. But the thing is, the wholesale, wholesale. I'm gonna, I'm gonna right. try to maximize. Well, I'm saying, most of it's the retail. Well, yeah. Okay, so wholesale works two ways. Either, either a guy that we work with is gonna need this watch on call. We'll flip it off to him. But more or less speaking, if I need to wholesale this watch, nobody's gonna pay more than what I just offered you for it. So Side just question. Going to. Oh, we we're working all these deals. Huh? Yeah. How about here? Okay, what do we this, do here? This is this is we also a hundred. This is a hundred percent consignment question. As a matter yeah. of fact, I have somebody that, if you don't mind, I want to show this watch to, and he's gonna put a finite number on it. We finally came to a deal. We took in a rose gold double balance skeleton in trade for our white gold double balance baguette. Sunny Miami never disappoints. On the way to see probably one of the most famous and iconic watch collectors out there, my friend Alfredo Peramico. I cannot wait to see what's in store when we get to see him. I hear the door open. Oh, behind us. Oh. <laughs> Good to see you too. Yeah. Guys, I'm here with uh, a very dear friend, uh, a famous collector as I like to call him. A lot of you guys probably already know who this gentleman is, but I had an opportunity to sit down with him and talk collecting watches. Alfredo Paramico, meet my audience. We're gonna have Hello, a great guys. time because not only we're gonna talk about a lot of collectability, what it takes to be a collector, a journey of a collector, how a collection can evolve. We can also show you some of the watches that go along with it. Not to make this a trip down memory lane. I know your background was investment banking. Yeah. Uh, I know that economics is your jam. How do we go from investment banking economics to collecting some of the most important watches in the world? Well, actually, because I always loved watches since I was like 15. And uh, I remember that during the, the 80s, end of the 80s, there were the first uh, magazines on watches released in Italy. And I was so happy the first days of the month with the new release to go and buy the magazine. The only issues that was that the magazine was of course over in 20 minutes and I had to wait for 30 days, you know, for the next episode. So I always loved watches and uh, as soon as uh, I could, because as I told you, after my degree, I went to London working as investment banker. I was trading uh, options and um, I started to collect watches. Uh, of course, at that time, it was mainly vintage watches. We're talking about the Patek Philippe uh, of the 40s, of the 50s, the Crown Perpetual Calendar, the 1518, the 2499, and also the very important Rolexes like the Keeley, you know, the Moonface, uh, all these kind of watches. And then um, in 2000, and um, should probably should be 2012, 2013, now 10 years ago, uh, I decided to buy back my life I sold part of my collection, I sold down to Miami here, and uh, I said, okay, I certainly cannot enjoy the beach every single day of my life. So after a couple of months, I was getting seriously bored. I said, uh, well, I need to definitely do something with watches, which is my passion. So I opened a, a company here, and so I'm doing trading watches since 2013. So um, it's about the time we met when more or less, yes, yes. yeah. The first probably antique show, yes, yeah, remember, first right? antique yeah, show, yeah, exactly. first antique show, or in New York, I did WGG, remember very well. Yes. So you know, I have been doing it watches probably um, all my life. I've been quite uh, lucky, and finally, I managed to buy, uh, which is to me the Destriero, which is the most important Destriero ever produced because the Destriero was made in 1993 to celebrate the 125th birthday of IWC. And uh, it was produced in a yellow gold, in a rose gold and in palladium. And this is the only example made in white gold. And on top, you have the bezel, 
with, uh, with like baguette, and every single link of the bracelet is filled by diamonds. You have to see the back of this thing. It's, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is an absolute marvel of a watch. And again, oftentimes you guys hear me throw terminology around, such as split second chronograph, perpetual calendar, minute repeater, tourbillon. And we just recently did a video with Mark going through all the iterations of yeah. the complications and how complex it gets. The minute you try to put that under a single roof, you'd be hard pressed to find 10 watchmakers in the world that can even make this. Absolutely. How about that? And that's what's, that's, the, that's what's most amazing about these. And I'm just gonna go back to what you said earlier, and that is you know, the post quartz crisis. You have to understand, uh, guys, novice collectors always ask me like, well, I want to collect this and I'm fond with Rolexes. I said, it's very hard to collect Rolex because they made so many of them. However, you have to use common sense and realize that, look, they're going to make lots of this. Like, in the, I know you like shiny watches. Yeah. So, for example, the Ice GMT, this is the Ice GMT, right? This is full baguette, full bracelet. This is one of the uh, newest model they came out with on a bracelet and this thing is absolute. So what's the MSRP on this? It's something it was probably 470, 480. Exactly. Matter. Yeah, so Alfredo likes vintage stuff, but he doesn't shy away from stuff like this and this is due to numbers. Very, very few of these are made or going to be made. Now, if you go back post quartz crisis, again, the popularity of quartz watches haven't died down specifically. So what, what does that mean? for companies like Blancpain, for companies like Frank Mueller, for companies like Gerald Genta. That means they made very few watches. Their production numbers those years were very, very small, and they slowly grew back up as popularity of mechanical watches were brought back, which is why that's another, you know, because I always ask a question, I try to answer in my head uh, as to why you would find older brigades in the collections such as this, because going back to that time, there were a lot fewer of these made versus today. And that's really what that comes down to. You look at, uh, us always try buying up these blanc ponds and brigades and people asking why. Well, there's a reason why, because I think the watch market overall is coming back to the appreciation of what watch is all about, and that's horology and mechanics. And that's the old saying, they don't make them like they used to. They still do. That doesn't apply in the watch world. It's just they don't make as little as they used to. Yeah, you know, talking of brigade, you know, I think that those are three of the I would probably call milestones of the, of the Breguet production. Well, the Basically, you have the chronograph in platinum, which is extremely rare. Then we have the mu repeater in platinum, and we have the tourbillon. So, um, and considering the fact that Breguet himself created this, the tourbillon, well, the mini repeater, they give a little bit of credit to the other guy, but yeah. in a sense, this is also his. How hard? on a scale of, as a collector, on a scale of one to 10, it is next to impossible to find this on platinum. The I platinum is next to impossible. Next the to 32, 37 is so difficult. This is a little this bit easier. This is something that you can find in the market. Uh, but not, not so much in Not platinum. so easy, Yellow but gold, you can yes. find, yeah. And the mini repeater, again, in platinum is so few, so few yeah. made. It's, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's very what, rare. This is, I know this is somewhat recent, because I know this because I've sold you a few older yeah. brigades as well. This is somewhat recent. What pushed you specifically to brigade? Another big, big name of uh, watchmaking, which is uh, Daniel Roth. I'm completely in love with uh, Daniel Roth production because at Breguet. The, 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 spoiler alert, Daniel Roth made this turbine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really in love with the production of Daniel Roth when he was at Breguet, because uh, we, never, we never have to uh, forget that it, thanks to Daniel Roth, I mean, Breguet is now back on track because he basically, uh, in, in the 70s, he started the game, the production with uh, the perpetual calendar, with uh, the tourbillon, uh, with the movement, with the complications. Mm. And here, I also want to show you something which Speaking is extremely of rare. Uh, if you guys Speaking want to see Daniel Daniel Roth, Roth, if you can find one of those, call me. <laughs> this is probably, uh, I mean, sometimes there is an abuse of the word unique when you talk about watches. Uh, so I would never say this is unique. But let me tell you something. In sure. 30 years, I try to find the most important watches on Earth. This is the first time I see this kind of watch. This I is have never seen one in person. This is basically the very first perpetual calendar made by Daniel Roth and his own name in collaboration with uh, Philippe Dufour. And uh, just 20 pieces were made in stainless steel like this. But this is the only one we know with the Simon dial. This is really, a, I think it's a kind of unique Daniel Roth piece, probably one of the most important of his production. So let me segue into the next question, because people like to hear numbers, right? What is a v approximate value on a watch like this, as of today? 
I would say $150,000. Now, mind you, uh, seemingly Daniel Roth, one of the things I love about Daniel Roth, because Daniel Roth has a distinct look, right? There are certain brands out there that will unmistakably be that. Frank Mueller, I believe, is the, the easiest example. If you go so, back to the 90s, if you go back to early 2000s, you see a tenor shape watch, you automatically start thinking Frank Mueller, right? Well, Daniel Roth, it's unmistakable, you know, double case, uh, the unmistakable shape. This is one watch, when you look at it from afar, you know that's a Daniel Roth, right? Yeah. Uh, for me, they seemingly all look the same. And one of the things that I admire about you is knowledge. Right? Knowledge is the biggest key in this game because if somebody brings this watch to 9 out of 10 dealers down here in Miami or Philadelphia, wherever it might be, uh, uh, looks like a $5,000 watch. <laughs> Stainless steel, Daniel Roth, five grand, right? People have, often have no idea, which is why I always stress the importance of if you're going to be a watch collector, if you're there for the flex aspect of it, absolutely nothing wrong with that either. But if you're going to get into something like this, you have to understand why this watch is $150,000. For yeah, you tell the story, you tell about, I mean, about the food, you tell about mm, the time when they tried to basically... I mean, there are so many things to know. It's, uh, it's not easy, but you have to do it. For example, see that you are watching these other... Uh, One of the most undervalued lines and watches and well-made well watches uh, today, the modern version. Did you see what Chopard did with, um, with I, the Crystal I was, I was really shocked by the resonance that uh, the Chopard production had at the Watches and the Wonders of last week. And uh, this watch that they just made the re-edition in stainless steel, this watch was probably the star of the show. I was amazed. Uh, this particular watch is called uh, Luke and uh, it was made in 1996 with a movement that was uh, made by uh, Parmigiani. The movement is unbelievable with, uh, with the Allmark, with the Geneva Allmark, with the COSC certificate. And the most Michael important Rota. thing, yes, that's amazing. What I really love this watch is the dial. The dial is made by a company called the Metalem, which is the same company who produced the dial for Philippe Dufour. And you can see, you know, from the layout of the dial, the shape of the dial, you can certainly see this. This is the star of the <laughs> there show. There is a long story about this watch, honestly, because, um, again, this magazine is dated 1995. So I think at that time I was 26 and I probably just started my, uh, my job as investment banker. Uh, and I remember that I was completely in love with this watch. Uh, maybe we should say a little bit more about Gerald Genta. Gerald Genta, we all know, is the guy who designed the Royal Oak, the Nautilus, we know so well. Engineer, but, yeah. Midas, <laughs> among yeah, I mean, there are so many. Many. I mean, so many. He's, he's the guy, he's the guy, okay? He's the guy. He's the guy. But what I really love were his productions, because the Gerald Genta in the 90s, they were the watches to have. They were so expensive. In 1994, 1995, this watch was probably the equivalent of today, $3 million. I know exact retail on it because you know? I've sold three of them. So the, exactly. one on the, the one on the strap that belonged to Prince, what was his name? Yeah, Je Jeffrey. Uh, Prince Jeffrey, who yeah. spent $60 billion in under a second. Exactly. Uh, he was charging him one37 Swiss franc. Okay, in 1995. In 1995. About 30 that's years three ago. million, four million dollars. Absolutely. So when I saw this watch for the first time and uh, I realized that how expensive it was, I said, okay, Alfredo, please, please forget about this watch. Then, you know, things were doing well. I was doing well, my job, and said, okay, maybe one day I could buy this watch. And I saw this watch going for auction uh, in 2002, probably, Antiquorum. Still a huge price, impossible. But then I said, one day I need to really own this watch. So I've been chasing this watch for the last 20 years of my life. Since 1995. 1995. <laughs> this is dated. Okay, it's a <laughs> There's a date on here. There's a date. When uh, the watch came for sale at auction at Christmas in Dubai, was like two years ago, I received a message from a guy in Dubai saying, I feel like a watch that you could like. When I saw the watch, I said, this is the master. N now, never again. So basically, I bought the watch. The watch was not working, and I knew that. And this is basically the watch. Uh, this is the number one. This is the only one we know in platinum with the, the platinum bracelet. Bracelet very important. Most of them came Absolutely. on straps. I never. I had three. I had my hands on three of them, and I only seen them on straps. Never saw and them on the watch was not working. 
So what I had to do is that uh, I, s I gave the watch to a friend of mine here in Miami, at Bulgari, because the guy is in charge of the uh, Bulgari store. I waited 16 months to get the watch back, which I just received like a few weeks ago. And uh, I paid an <laughs> unbelievable amount. You told of me money how much you paid. We're not going to put that on. We're not going to put that on. Otherwise, number. you think I'm crazy. But let's explain let's why. Explain. Let's explain okay. how complicated this watch. This watch is basically on top of being a mini repeater, a tourbillon, and perpetual calendar, and 24 hours. It's also a grand sonnerie, which means that the watch can uh, chimes, okay, the hour and the quarters or just the quarters whenever you want. We, so we, be yeah, we, ta we talked about mini repeaters and we talked about petit sonneries and grand sonneries. This is a grand and petit sonnerie basically. So what you can do is you can switch this watch to either chime, as a, a normal mini repeater will chime out quarter hours, it'll chime out uh, the, the uh, quarter hours, quarter oh, hours and, and minutes. minutes. But you can set this watch to only chime the quarter hours and the hours. Right, so you can do a grand sonnery or a petite sonnery, hence why we can Exactly, from. the grand sonnery is the chime, I mean, it chimes the, the hours and the quarters at every quarter, mm -hmm. while the, the petite sonnery just chimes the hour at o'clock and then just the quarter, the single quarter. And on top of that, on top of that, here the chime is Westminster chimes. So it's not the regular chime of a, a mu repeater, but it has a melody, which is the Westminster melody. Is there another watch out there with all of these complications in one today? Uh, no, I don't think so. The Skymoon Turbion uh, from Patek Philippe does not do this. No. The Grandmaster Chime does that, but it doesn't have the other Maybe there is a Bacheron Constantin. Yes. Maybe. The Grand Complication exactly. Bacheron is the one that does that. This is the 3617, okay, which is the crown with the perpetual calendar. Mm -hmm. okay? First of all, look at the dial. It's so beautiful with the two tones. The guilloche dial. This is so beautiful. I mean, the finishing of Brigade, especially exactly. from that area. And think about it. This is finish. like a 3970 with the same movement. This is probably like 50,000. A lot of value. And I'm not going to get into an argument so which movement is better. I'm probably, I'm, I would stick with Brigade, to be honest with you. But, but the finishing on Brigade versus, if you take a 3970, you put it side by side with the Brigade, and you start looking at the dial, you start looking at the case, you start looking at the finishing all around, Brigade will win every single time. Alfredo, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for taking out the time, meeting with me. Lo thank you for coming. Lo lo thank you for coming view. to Miami, my place. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say you something. How many times you received uh, from Instagram messages of people, young people saying, Roman, you really spied all my life, all my knowledge in watches. So many times, no? I do get I that do. very often. It plays yes. to my narcissistic personality, I'll be honest with you, but those are the people that I also take time to, whenever there's a actual question behind it, for advice, I always try to take my time within reason. That's exactly what I do. And when people text me saying, you spied me, I always try to say, okay, it's fine. I inspired you. Now, why don't you inspire me? Tell me what you know. Tell me what you like. Tell me why you like this watch more than the other one. Tell me what you are thinking. Exactly like Jean-Claude Biver did it. Yeah. You know, he said, I want to go out with my, with my son and try to understand what he likes. This is so crucial in life, I think, you know, trying to be, you know, up to date. This is so important. He's being so modest right now, by the way. <laughs> uh, we're talking about him being one of the most important watch collectors in this industry. We're talking about... As an individual, he's, he's got a lot more up his sleeve. Did you know that this guy recently finished the competition in the World Series of Fitness? Please. This guy can bench pre press me with this couch. Never again one. in my life, no, no. I'll do it. You look spent. I was following the stories on Instagram. This guy, was, you know this Dos Equis commercial? He's one of those most interesting people that in the world. Was, so that, that check out his brutal. Instagram. You'll see what I'm talking that about. Was br that was brutal. Again, thank you so much for letting thanks us into you your guys. home. It's always Let, a pleasure. Thank you for letting us into and give us a lot of the insight of this information, guys. Definitely give him a follow on his Instagram. You will not regret it. It's There's certain accounts on Instagram that you must follow. His account is actually one of those. Thank Alfredo, you. Alfredo, thank you so thanks much. Thanks to you, Roman. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Guys, I really hope that Alfredo opening up his collection to you guys via this media has opened your eyes a little bit and made you ask yourself again, what is the ultimate collection? What am I out there collecting? I hope this sparked an interest in something that you may have never considered in the past. But this is what this is all about. It's about transparency. How often have I told you guys, hey, these are the sleepers, go after them if it's something that sings to you. With that said, as always guys, like, comment, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one.